Lab number seven is entitled Low Distortion Sinusoidal Oscillators for use in audio test equipment. What we're going to do in this lab is we're going to take a DC source and turn it into a sine wave generator. You recall from ECE 201, in 202 we talked about the solutions of second order differential equations. If you had a circuit with more than one capacitor, it's possible to have a solution of this form. But the terms K and phi depend upon initial conditions, and the term alpha and omega d depend upon circuit structure. It's possible with a perfect L and a perfect C to have the term alpha go to zero. If alpha goes to zero, then the transient response becomes a sine wave. Now we don't have a perfect inductor and a perfect capacitor, so we have to find some way to create that effect. But we're going to show that it's possible to generate a sine wave by using this equation without a source. One of the circuits that we're going to look at a little bit later in this lecture was the master's thesis of William Hewitt, which was the start of the Hewitt Packard Corporation. There's a little bit of a write-up in the lab itself. You may notice with this lab that there is a section for background material here with the lecture notes, but also uh, typed up results so they can learn a bit more about oscillators. This is a topic that we haven't talked about in ECE 201, 202, 203, or 302. Since we don't have a perfect L and C, we're going to have to probably use an amplifier with some kind of a passive network to create this sourceless circuit. Now somehow I have to self-generate a signal, and maybe do this through feedback, to create this sine wave. But suppose that we could do this. What are some of the properties of these two boxes? Well, if you solve or measure for V2 divided by V1, that's the transfer function of, let's call this the box A. And then the output over the input here for this passive circuit would be V1 over V2, and let's call that the transfer function of box B. Now if you multiply those two transfer functions, the V2s and the V1s cancel, and you get that the product of the transfer functions of these boxes are equal to 1. In other words, the transfer function of the passive circuit is the reciprocal of the amplifier circuit. Now, if this does become an oscillator, it's going to oscillate perhaps just at one frequency. At that frequency, the gain of the amplifier will have a value, and the attenuation of the passive circuit would have to be the same value. In other words, 1 over the gain. Let's take a look at it for our first oscillator called a phase shift oscillator. And in the box with the amplifier, let's use an inverting op amp structure. As we'd shown in ECE 201 and 202 and 203, that this is a model for this op amp circuit. So we could just use it in place of this symbol. In other words, when you apply a voltage here, all that voltage is across this resistor because the voltage here is driven to zero. That causes a current to flow up into this resistor, and that gives us a negative voltage back to ground. Okay, so let's put that into our amplifier box. And we know that the gain of this circuit is a negative R2 over R1, and let's just let R2 be a multiple of R1. So that's 180 degrees of phase shift. Now if you take a single RC circuit, the most phase shift you can get out of it is 90 degrees. But you really only approach that 90 degrees of phase shift. So I would need to put together minimally three resistor capacitor circuits, and here's the other resistor right here, to create a total phase shift that could equal 180. So what's going to happen is that this circuit is going to have a transfer function, and at one frequency, the phase shift from output back to this input would be exactly 180 degrees. Let's analyze this circuit and try to figure out where that's going to happen. Okay, so let, let's model the op amp. It looks like a controlled source from here to ground. It has an input resistance back to ground on this side. So here is that op amp input, and then here is the op amp output over here. Again, we're assuming this circuit's oscillating, so there would be some currents, call them I1, I2, and I3, circulating through the R's and C's of the circuit. Let's write mesh equations for this circuit, and we've looked at a couple different methods in 201 and 202, but one particular one that might be quick would just be the inspection algorithm that we talked about in those courses. And so what goes into row 1, column 1 is the sum of the impedances around mesh 1. What's common between mesh 1 and 2 is R, and so we'll subtract that, and there's nothing between meshes 1 and 3. And if you go around the mesh counterclockwise, you see a drop of minus n times v. Okay, 
So that's our first equation in three unknowns, I1, I2, and I3. On the second mesh, I've got R, R, and 1 over SC, so that's going to go in row 2, column 2. Between meshes 2 and 1, I have a resistor R, so I'll subtract that. And between meshes 2 and 3, I also have a resistor R, so I'll subtract that. So it's the sum of the impedances between the meshes, but negated. Then lastly, around the third mesh, and of course there was no voltage source in mesh 2, as much as a 0 here. And then around mesh 3, I've got, again, two resistors and one capacitor, and the impedance of that is 1 over SC. So that's going to go on row 3, column 3. Between meshes 3 and 2, there's a resistor R, so we'll subtract that. Nothing between mesh 3 and mesh 1. Okay, now, th the voltage V that's controlling back over here is also equal to one of our mesh currents times the resistor R. So I could substitute that in back over here, so I'd have a minus N times R times I3. But I3 is on this side of the equation, so I could bring it over here. When I do that, this is my matrix. This is a technique we talked about in ECE 201 and 202 for writing equations by inspection. If you don't like that, just do KVL around each loop. Now suppose that we solve for the current I1. Well, a couple ways you could do that. One is to use Kramer's rule. And I'll take the left side of the equation and put it into column 1 to solve for I1. And then find this determinant with this in column 1 divided by this determinant here of this impedance matrix. Now, if it's an oscillator, then this, this current is not equal to zero. If we likewise solve for I2 and I3, we get the same kind of a result. We get zero divided by the determinant of this Z matrix. But if it's oscillating, these currents would not necessarily be equal to zero. What does that say about the determinant of the Z matrix? Well, the only number that you can divide zero and not get zero is zero itself. So that implies that the matrix must be equal to zero at the frequency of oscillation. And so let's, let's take that determinant, set it equal to zero, and see what it shows us in terms of the behavior of the circuit. So let me expand down column one, take this entry here, and I'm left with this two by two matrix. So the product of this times this minus this times this is right here. And then I go down to here, and I'm gonna multiply this by minus one, so I'll get a plus R. And then wiping out this row and this column, I've got this times this minus this times this. That's a term right over here. Let's take a look at what this determinant turns out to be. Here I've got a product here of SC squared. And if I multiply this times this, I'm going to get this term squared, which is 4S squared, C squared, R squared. And then I'm going to have the inner product, actually it's the same thing twice, so I'll get 4SCR, and then 1 times 1. Now let's find the same denominator here. This is going to give me a minus r squared with the minus sign that's here, then multiply that by s squared c squared. Okay, now for this term over here, we've got sc for a common denominator, and then I'll multiply through by this r term, so I'm going to get a minus and a minus, which is a plus, and then I get another minus, so it's going to give me a minus here of 2scr times r squared, and then I'm going to have a minus r squared multiplying through that, and then I'm also going to have another r multiplying here, so it's going to give me r cubed times n, plus sign here, but another minus sign coming through. And then let's find a common denominator, so I'll multiply this by sc. And again, all it has to equal zero. Okay, let's evaluate this, determine the next step here. And I've got a s squared c squared, and so multiplying that by sc, I've got s cubed c cubed. And then this term here cancels with one that's here, so I have three. Now I'm gonna multiply through by this numerator term. So I get 3s squared c squared r squared times scr, which gives me this term right here. And then I've got that times this term, which is going to give me 4s squared c squared r squared. And then lastly, scr times that term. And then I've got 1 times this, which is going to give me this term. Then 1 times this, which is going to give me this term. And then 1 times 1. And then, so I can subtract or add this next term, let me multiply numerator and denominator by s squared c squared. So that's going to give me minus 2 s cubed c cubed c cubed r cubed minus r squared times s squared c squared. And then this will become s cubed times c cubed times n r cubed. All right, let's put this all together if we can. Get some term cancellations here too. Here we've got the term s cubed c cubed r cubed, and that's the same as this term here. 
So we can subtract off two of these here and just be left with one. That's the one times this term right here. And then we've got this term right here, which has got also s cubed, c cubed, r cubed. So that's the value of n that's over here. And then I've got four times this term. And then I've got three more here. So that's going to give me seven. And then I've got the same term here with one negative. So I'm left with plus six. Then I've got four SCR and another one, so that gives me five. And then lastly, the one that's over here. So that's what my determinant is equal to with a common denominator in those two segments that were being uh, subtracted from each other. Now the denominator can't go to infinity, so the numerator must go to zero. Now if it is oscillating, then S is equal to J omega. And that means that S squared is minus omega squared. And S cubed is minus J omega cubed. Let's substitute it in for s cubed over here, and then s squared gives me a minus omega squared, and then just j omega for s, and then just a one that's over here. What I've got is a complex number, and this is equal to zero, but it's really zero plus j zero. And so we really have two equations that we can play with. If we take all the real parts and set them equal to zero, in other words, the left-hand side equaling the right-hand side, we get this term and the one equaling the zero. All right, that could solve for omega. This would be my this would be my frequency of oscillation. If I put this on the other side of the equation, it becomes positive, and then I can divide by six and divide by r squared c squared. So if I take the square root of both sides of the equation, I get the square root of six r c reciprocal for the frequency in radians per second. Let's just divide that by two pi, and then we should call this f naught or some subscript indicating it's a frequency of oscillation. Again, one frequency where that term is equal to zero. If you take the imaginary terms that are here, and scroll them down, but, but these are the two imaginary terms, and set that equal to j0. You can drop the j, there's one common there. And then I can also divide through by omega, get rid of one of those, and get one of those over there. And then also one r and c. So I get c squared, r squared, and just a one over here. Now I know what the frequency of oscillation, omega is equal to one over square root of six rc, or squaring that is one over six r squared c squared. So I'm just gonna substitute that in right over here. That's gonna cancel these two. And I'm left with then that, if I put this on the other side of the equation, this becomes a plus, n plus one divided by six is equal to five. You can cross multiply and that gives me that n plus one is 30, or that n is 29. So these become what are called the conditions for oscillation. The amplifier needs to have a gain of minus 29 because it's an inverting amplifier. And at that frequency of omega naught, which is 1 over 2 pi square root of 6 RC, we'll have a, a sine wave created. And at this frequency, the passive circuit will have a gain of 1 29th with a phase angle of 180. We're going to verify this with some spice simulation as part of our lab report.